All right. Thank you for uh, thank you all for showing up early in the morning. Uh, particularly thanks to our visitors uh, making a special trip from uh, Wanahanto, Irapuato. It's, did you guys fly? I suppose yes, you did. Yes, okay. Yes. So even then, I mean, uh, on short notice, uh, they are both very busy. Um, we really appreciate them taking time, both uh, Rory and Ruben. Uh, we got two uh, seminars in Wanda, which is a rarity in, <laughs> in Simit. I think it's probably record. So thank you both. Really, we uh, appreciate your taking time out of your busy schedule and coming down to share your stories with us. So let's start with uh, Rory. Rory Sauls, he uh, got both his uh, MA and PhD at Oxford University and did a couple of postdocs, one at uh, Cornell with uh, Thomas Butnell, and then the second one at uh, the University of Switzerland and uh, Lausanne. Uh, for the last eight years, right, he has been at Lan Habio, uh, working on uh, adaptation and all the stuff in maize. We will also do study adaptation of maize then in Mexico, uh, the center of origin. And now uh, it's a loss, I'm sure, for Lan Habio. He's moving to Penn State next year, uh, which is again for Penn State. That's a great campus. I have been there many a time. So you will enjoy being there as well. So he's going to tell us today. Let's start with uh, Rory. And his title, you can see, Friends in High Places, Interrogation from Wild Relatives in the Adaptation of Maize to the Central Highlands of Mexico. Okay. Let me connect myself here. So it works? Yes, good. Okay, thank you for being here. Thank you for the introduction. Thank you, Lucero, for organizing us to come down. So I've been told I have an hour, which is probably excessive. So I will talk for, I'll see how far we go. And um, as said, I'm going to be talking on this topic. But also, I want to highlight Langhebio, Simba staff, what we're doing. I think some of you have visited us there. Some of you may not know where we are. Um, I think probably later today we may talk a little bit about that, but really, just very briefly to start with, so Simbastab, as you may or may not know, is a Mexican public institution. We feature campuses across the country, each one doing slightly different things. The one in Irapuato is the one where you'll see the most plant science. Um, as the name implies, well, I won't spell out the acronym, but we are edu an educational institution, and we're providing what's called advanced education, which means masters and doctoral programs. So we don't have undergraduate students, but as an institution, we do directly award master's and doctoral degrees. And again, I think just to explain a little bit what we're about, we are really training, and I'd like to say we do applied training through fundamental research. So again, we're not a breeding program, we're not generating lines, etc. We're basically doing basic research. And again, although you know we have in Irapuato a sort of history of plant science, a lot of that is fundamental plant science. A lot of the, the major researchers there, if you like, are working in Arabidopsis, for instance, as systems. And so really in terms of maize, it's been me and Ruben. Um, and then a lot of guys are not working on plants at all. So it's a relatively small institution. You know, we're 20 or so PIs, but you'll have people there doing, you know, vertebrate ecology through to microbes, et cetera, et cetera. So again, just to give you a bit of a, a a sort of context of who we are, where we are. And again, I think that's something I'd like to mention a bit more later. So I, I thought I'd jump straight into a specific story, a story that's probably not too surprising for people here, but there may be a few details of interest. So going straight back, we have now, again, without trying to be too controversial, this idea we have maize domestication here, southwestern Mexico in the Bolsas River region, and we're going to put a number, about 9,000, plus or minus a few thousand years here or there. Um, and this is going on, obviously, from Pardig Loomis, our direct ancestor of cultivated maize. And this is happening, basically, in this sort of low to mid elevation region. And as we know, maize spreads very quickly. Okay, even archaeologically, we can get up to here, Tiwakan Valley, 
um, San Marcos Cave 5,000 years ago, things which are maize plants. And this is just one example of the spread that's going on. We have less archaeological record of what's going on in the lowland region simply because things don't preserve so well. So the oldest macro remains tend to be found quite high because it's drier, it's cooler, etc. And this for me as a you know, basic biologist is really the exciting question. Parve glumis itself now and 9,000 years ago has a fairly restricted geographic niche. Suddenly we subsample this genetic diversity and yet we can expand out of that niche very quickly. How can you do this? And it's not simply a case that you know, farmers can do all this wonderful stuff. Farmers can only follow the plants. If the plants won't grow there, you can't go and live there either. And so that really is, that, is the big fundamental question, how we can rejuggle this genetic diversity to then expand and do all these new things. And there are a number of answers to that, and I'm interested in probably all of the possibilities. But today's possibility, and the one I want to focus on today, at least with regard to this expansion to the Mexican highlands, is the role that Mexicana Tia Sinti may have played. So as this first cultivated maize is coming out, out of the Parviglumis niche into the highlands, not only does it encounter new environmental challenges, but it encounters a new subspecies of Tia Sinti. And as they are subspecies, this, this, and cultivated maize are all fully interfertile within, you know, given a few barriers to crossing that exist. So really just to emphasize Parvig Loomis, the ancestor, you're not going to find this much above about 17, 1800 meters, okay, in elevation. And simply Mexicana, you're not going to find that much below 17, 1800 meters, but you will find it going up to 2000, 2500 plus meters, no? And these two guys, we think, probably diverged about 60,000 years ago. So, as cultivated maize comes up here, we have the possibility of hybridization. And now, to cut a long story short, we can put numbers on this. Yes, genes have moved from Mexicana to cultivated maize in the highlands of Mexico. And this may be up to 15%. Okay, this basically gives you this very exciting scenario that cultivated maize in this region has, you know, 15% of its genome coming from this guy who's been living in that environment tens of thousands of years before maize domestication even began. And so obviously the question is, is this important? Is this significant? This very compelling hypothesis that part of this gene flow is bringing in all this wonderful, useful, pre-adapted variation into early cultivated maize, allowing it, facilitating this adaptation to the highlands. That's a very nice idea, but is there any evidence for that? Alongside the more obvious kind of bringing in the good alleles, there are other more interesting, or not more interesting, but uh, allied um, demographic things that may be going on here. And obviously, I think we're all fairly familiar with this idea. We have a domestication bottleneck, which is reducing diversity as we come out of Parve glumis. We have additional founder effects as we go and expand. And the highlands, I think, is a nice example of where you know, we, we clearly potentially have a fairly restricted initial population. These often tend to be kin-structured. One of the great things about maize is it's very easy to give to your friends. You hand them an ear. You know, that's what we still do nowadays, have an ear of corn. Obviously, when you're doing this, you're passing on things which are at least half-siblings. Okay, so if you are literally the farmer going up the next hill carrying a couple of ears in your pockets, you're obviously experiencing founder effects at that moment. In contrast, Mexicana has a relatively large population size in this niche and a relatively lower number of deleterious effects. At least this is what's been suggested by a nice paper by Lee Wang working with Man Huff Matt Hufford in Iowa come out last year. So they were suggesting that this introgression not only potentially contributes good alleles from the highlands, but may actually promote recovery from the demographic costs of that initial domestication and then that colonization event. And that's somewhat different to what we see with someone like this guy here. It's not one of my collaborators, it's Neanderthals. And here when we look at Neanderthal introgression into modern humans, there's actually the reverse scenario has been proposed. That in fact the relatively limited population size of Neanderthals and therefore, population demographic costs associated with that would actually be refractory to introgression. Okay, such that you wouldn't introgress from Neanderthals because these are small populations carrying deleterious load. Here we're actually pro proposing, or Matt is proposing a reverse scenario 
where it's actually the, the larger affected population size promoting introgression from perhaps fairly small populations of that first maze going up into the highlands. So I come from a sort of, if you like, a molecular genetic background more than a population genetic background. So in the end, I kind of want to know what do the genes do? What is the functional role of these things? I don't just want SNPs. I want them to, to do things for me. So we're really interested in functional characterization. And a lot of this work has now sort of developed into a, a larger um, collaboration we have with a number of US groups. It's an NSF-funded project. And I think Ruben will talk possibly a little more about that as well. But what I specifically want to do with today is actually talk only about the bits which, if you like, are a more homegrown Langhebio product. And I want to focus on the Mexican students who've been doing this work. So again, we're not going to be talking about the big genomics data sets and things like this. We're talking about things we've been able to do effectively in a small lab in a relatively short period of time, really with fairly limited resources. And again, just to highlight what we have done and what, you know, the potential that's there really to tap into. So how are we going to go about this? So the first thing we want to do Okay, it's fine. You can even with a small number of SSRs, you can put a number and say there's 5, 10, 15% gene flow from Mexicana to Mexican Highland Maze. But where is that gene flow? Can we map it within the genome? And we've seen um, with a number of data sets as we increase marker density, yes, we can start to find those regions. Again, there's been publications on that. But for our strategy, again, we're gonna, I'm going to show here a bit of resequencing data where we've tried to map more finely where this introgression is within the genome so we can start asking what it's doing. Then we want to try and link these events to phenotypic variation. So again, we can use either our own or other people's data sets where we have um, mapping of QTL effectively within genomes and start asking, do these co-localize co with regions of introgression? And then finally, who are the genes within the introgression events? And again, part of that, particularly when we're looking at, at you know, fairly divergent highland maze, we haven't got great information about those genomes. It's not enough to say it'll probably be the same genes as B73 with a few SNPs. We know that's not going to be the case. And so here, yes, we have resequencing, but also we're actually advancing with de novo genome sequencing. This is a bit more of an international collaboration, but this is looking to be going really quite well. And very soon we should have very nice de novo assemblies for some of these highland maize varieties. And again, just to emphasize here, we're not hanging these sequences onto the B73 scaffold. We're simply starting blind from the beginning to see what we find. So who are our sequencing targets for this part of the project? So for resequencing, we focused a lot of our, our highland work on Palomero Tolokenio, again, historically considered this ancient founder race of the, of the highland, highland Mexican maze. And we've used, actually, often gone back to the Mexi 5 accession, which is the one you know you find all, all the way back to Wellhausen. No, this is the, almost the type accession for this guy, one of the two of these early collections. And in this little work I'm talking about, we've taken two individual outbred indi um, individuals, and we resequenced these to 40x. We also took a more modern uh, collection um, of a Mashito from Michoacan. This is, a, again, a sort of derived highland land race. Um, this was collected only a few years ago by our colleague, Alfredo Carrera, who's working in Chapingo and Michoacan. Here we took a single individual, and we derived 70x coverage for that. And pretty much irrespective of those, we can identify about 50 million SNPs in these individuals. So that's our sort of what we're playing with. And then, as I say, just to highlight that it's ongoing, we've gone back again to this PT. And this is we're working with Matt and then a, a slightly broader consortium to, to generate de novo sequence. And that's just actually coming off, off the nanopore almost as we speak. And that's looking very promising. We're getting lots of long, lovely reads. And that should go together very nicely. Um, one thing we do obviously highlight here, these are all outbred accessions, so this poses limitations. So when we do our two individuals here, and then we come and we do our de novo here, we're using a different plant. We're using a different genome. No? So that's just the reality of that situation. Something we have spent a lot of effort on here is that the individual who we're sequencing, we also made sure was propagated. So we have seed, we have back cross seed, we actually have now quite large mapping populations which are coming from this guy. So anything we do see at later date, we can go back and we can actually you know, deliver, here is the SNP. So that was, again, fundamental to the way this project was put together at the beginning here, which I think was you know, different from some of the, the earlier land race sequencing initiatives that we had. And again, because I like the figure, 
we have you know, very straightforward evidence that we have local adaptation, obviously, of Palomero Tolokeno to the highlands. So these were grown with Denise's help in the Metepec uh, Simit Station, and these we grow down in Valle de Banderas in Nayarit. And you know, this is a very straightforward way of seeing that, yeah, the land race is quite happy in the highlands, whereas B73 turns into a cabbage, and we virtually get nothing. So to do, look for introgression, there are a number of ways of doing it. We're using this ABBA-BABA test, which you may or may not heard of, more formally known as FD statistic. Again, this was first actually used a lot with, with human um, genomics, again, Neanderthal introgression. And it's a test that works really when you have fairly low numbers of individuals. So again, for people working with ancient DNA, this was an attractive way of doing it. And again, here, if we're working with two, three genomes, this is something we can use. If you have larger populations, you may approach the same question in a different way. And very simply, what we're doing is we generate little four sample trees at any particular site. We have an outgroup, which we use Trypsicum. We have Mechicana. Oops. We have our highland samples. We have lowland maize samples. And what we're looking for are sites throughout the genome which follow one or two patterns. First, we have the ABBA pattern. We have an ancestral site which we can see is, is derived in Mexicana. And that's going to be the same in both of our patterns. And then we're just simply going to ask, how often, given this, do we see that the highland genome has the derived Mexicana site, whereas the lowland maize maintains the ancestral site? And how often is the situation reversed? And now we have the highland maize having the ancestral site and the lowland maize carrying that derived site. And obviously, if we send to see an enrichment for the ABBAs, in at least the way I've written it round, it means that highland maize is sharing something with Mexicana, and we can see that as evidence of introgression. Now, obviously, this only works if you're ABBA or BABA. If you're neither of these things, unfortunately, you're no use to us. Okay? So we need to have a good number of sites. So from our sites, we can come up with almost a million ABBA-BABA informative sites were identified in our genomes. Okay, so we're here for the purposes of this analysis. We're pooling all of our highland guys to get a, a joint frequency distribution. And then all of these other genomes are borrowed from maize hat map. And in fact, probably the biggest limitation on the number of informative sites we have is the number of sites we, we can identify in Trypsicum that we can borrow across to maize. So if we were just using these three, we'd have many more sites that we could call across them all. So in order to say any particular region is an introgression candidate, obviously, any single site on its own is not going to tell us anything. So we're going to be using here windows of 50 SNPs to make that statistical determination. And you could make bigger or smaller windows, but we've gone for 50 SNP windows. And then we're just scanning through the genome, asking at any particular point, do we see evidence of introgression? So remember, the whole point of this was not to quantify globally introgression, but to find out where the introgression is. So again, this is a nice example of where marker density is actually very important. We're not just getting SNPs because we want SNPs. No, if we want to find these things, we need to have a certain density. Generating a null distribution for this statistic is not trivial. And again, depending on our sampling, it may or may be, be reasonable or not. So in the end, we just took, I'm showing you here very simply, we took all our windows, we looked at the distribution we got of our statistic, and we just took either the top 1% or the top 10% outliers as our candidate regions. Okay, and I'll show you in both these cases, these still give us a very conservative um, approximation of, of where this integration is. So when we had our windows were adjacent, if both windows were selected, i.e. they were both outlying, we simply concatenated them. And by doing this, we generated what we called events. So the events are just windows that we can stick together. And when we used the 1% outliers, we could identify 80 events. And this covers about 8 megabases of physical space, which is about you know, half a percent of the genome. Again, if we push out to 10%, we get more events, more physical space, more genome. And again, both these values are pretty conservative with respect to these numbers of 10 or 15% that we can see in the literature for a similar, you know, what's the global level of introgression. Or again, if we just calculate the, the D statistic at a genome level, we get a number of about 7 or 8% in our samples using this joy frequency. So again, this suggests that we, we're missing a lot of introgression, but you know, hopefully we haven't got too many false positives in there either. So it's, it seems a reasonable approximation to start with. Now, what we find is that integration is distributed throughout the genome. Probably not too surprising. 
And here, this is just a circle plot with our 10 uh, chromosomes. And here, I'm highlighting the big introgression events. This was regions where we could stick multiple windows together. And again, this brings out something that I think is, is important here. We have the blue dots are just the center points of our big introgression events from our 10% outliers. The red ones are 1% outliers. And then again, we go again to our good colleague, Matt, Matt Hufford in Iowa, who's done already published something on this, on this subject using uh, SNP chip data. And in his work, he identified nine big regions of introgression, again, from Mexican highland maize populations. And we see that certain of these things, we're going to come back to this guy, which I know, again, people in this room have already looked at this, this big inversion polymorphism we see on chromosome four, very clearly coming in from Mexicana in Matt's work. And then we also see very strong signature here. Again, he has a region on five that we have some matching there, region on six matching a little bit on nine we catch in one of our, our things. Other regions we don't really get so much. There's a nice region on three that we find that was published in a, in a, a later paper from Matt's group by Lee et al, but that was not captured in his initial SNP chip uh, region. So partially, it, this is nice. It suggests we're doing the right thing. We're finding stuff. But the more important point here is that these regions are, don't appear to be random. Okay, there are certain regions that are found at very high frequencies, not from our data, but from other data across multiple populations of Mexican highland maize. Again, arguing that they are doing something. Okay, again, we might reasonably hypothesize that all Mexican highland maize has a percentage of Mexicana because they tend to hybridize and it's there and it disappears and everyone has something different. No, we don't see that. We see a certain amount of reproducibility, which again, it doesn't demonstrate function, it doesn't demonstrate adaptation, but it certainly is consistent with both of those hypotheses. No? So at the same time, we took our PT and we crossed it to the lowland land race for Aventador and we generated an F2 population. And then this was something actually we did with, with CESA here at CIMIT. We got one of these little uh, mass agro grants to, to run a couple of plates of dart seek and we genotyped 170 individuals from that population. What we then did, we anchored our SNPs and we thin them out and we, able, we use these to build a, a little linkage map. And our linkage map covers you know, just over a thousand centimorgans. So here is our linkage map. This is physical position, but again here, we're just color coding with recombination frequency. Here, the telomeric regions are always, have a lot more recombination, so <laughs> they're just the two plus. So these are much higher than this would show. But we were really interested in what's going on in these kind of you know, Central American and slightly, slightly more distal regions. So here, I'm just uh, overlapping again. The blue dots are our 10% outlying events. These magenta bars and this little cyan guy here are the events that Matt had identified previously. So for instance, we see again, I guess the poster boy is this region on chromosome four, which co-localizes with this basically this dead spot here, we don't see recombination, and there's already plenty of evidence that this is actually a chromosomal inversion that's inverted in highland maize with respect to lowland maize. So obviously, we don't expect recombination there across, across that in this particular mapping population. Other regions are centromeric. Again, we can read into that what we will, um, and others are scattered around. So I think this is an interesting observation. Again, it's a little, a little bit of chicken and egg going on here. We find big regions in low recombination. But if there was a lot of recombination, they wouldn't be big. We might not find them, et cetera, et cetera. So it's a little hard to interpret. Obviously, there are theoretical reasons why people like the idea that low recombination regions are related with introgression. So this, you know, theoretically, we may have this idea where we have a load of co-adapted alleles in a nice, useful introgression in a big inversion. They all come in together. That doesn't break up. We don't lose that adaptation. We can basically move the whole adaptive syndrome around as a single chunk. Again, it's not so straightforward to test. And as I say, there's certainly a bias in finding the regions in the first place. But at the same time, and I think something that you see from doing this type of analysis using sequencing as opposed to SNP chips, is we also have a lot of small regions. Okay, so this is our are really big guys that you know, everyone finds, and then we find a lot of little things. Again, are they meaningful little things or not? That's the big question. Here, I'm just graphing the cumulative size of our introgression regions. They've been ordered from smallest to largest, 
against the number of gene models we find using B73 annotation. And we see pretty much that this conforms to the expectation. If anything, gene density is lower at the higher regions. But basically what we're saying here is these little guys have genes in them. So again, it would be reasonable. In maize genome is a big genome. It has a lots of non-genic regions. You could easily hide 15% of Mechicana introgression within that genome and not touch a single gene. And certainly when you find these little small fragments, again, a reasonable hypothesis is that these are just left over from those ancestral hybridization events. They have no genes. There's no selection to get rid of them. They'll just hang out. But we don't really see that. We do see that our small regions are as gene-rich or even more gene-rich than the larger regions. Again, it's anecdotal, but we can find a lot of these very classical maize genes. These are not all of the classic maize genes we can find in our regions. But these are all genes that every you know, maize geneticist would agree do something. So whether they're doing something different in Mexicana and cultivated maize, we don't know at this point. Or I'm not presenting data at this point. But certainly, these are real genes that apparently have moved from Mexicana to highland maize. So in our small F2 population, we, we had this growing in the lowlands. We had it growing in Nayarit. We took a few phenotypes, not very many. And we thought it would be fun to just try and run a few QTL on them. So again, here we're really literally using 150 plants, individuals in a field. Some of them fell over, whatever, et cetera. We're not, we haven't got massive power or massive reproducibility in this data set, but we can still try and map a few things and see what happens. Now, obviously, we were, well, perhaps we were hoping that we'd find major effect QTL which sit in the middle of our favorite introgression regions. And, you know, not to disappoint anybody, we didn't. Okay? There are a number of reasons why that might be the case. It doesn't mean it's not true, but anyway, here we are. So we took a few sort of obvious traits. So people who've worked with Mexican highland maize or even looked at maize growing around here will know it's all strongly pigmented. It's also strongly pubescent. And this is something that differentiates it very clearly from all lowland groups. Um, it also differentiates it from parvic lumis, but this is actually something you also see in Mechicana tiacinte. So right back to the, you know, the work of, of Wilkes and people like this, this shared morphology was very attractive from the start as an indication of gene flow. And it's been proposed that they, they kind of look the same either because Mechicana wants to look like maize so that nobody removes it from the field, or vice versa, whether this is an adaptive trait that's coming in from Mechicana to help highland maize. And again, you know, you can hypothesize that this keeps the plants warm, it protects them from UV, et cetera, et cetera. These are, these are other ideas. So anyway, we, we map pigment intensity, and we get a, a massive peak. Even in our small population, we could map pigment intensity to chromosome 2. These blue bars, again, are basically showing our introgression extrapolated from physical position onto our genetic map. And there's no evidence of introgression around this peak on chromosome 2. And again, People who are sort of a little bit followed any sort of maize genetics will know this is where um, we have the B1 gene, which is very well characterized to be related to stem pigmentation in maize. Again, there's already very nice work um, coming out from Vicky Chandler's lab, I mean, now, I don't know, 25 years ago, showing a great diversity of alleles which can pigment the maize stem. So, what this is telling us, it's very easy to invent new alleles to get this phenotype. So leaving aside the adaptive pressures of whether you may or not want to be pigmented, if you do, that variation seems to come up pretty frequently. And even within Mexican highland maize, there seem to be a number of alleles floating around which can do this. So at some level, you don't need Mexicana to do this for you. And if you want that variation, it's going to be generated fairly frequently. And most of these alleles are related to novel transposon insertions in the regulatory region of the B1 gene. Incidentally, South American maize also has this pigmentation, and obviously there's no Mexicana in South America. Here's another trait that's very characteristic of Mexican highland maize, very reduced tassel branching. So here we have one, often you don't see any, any lateral branches, and again we see this trait expressed very well here in Nayarit or equally up in Metapec. Um, we map again, we map a QTL for this. We get a very nice big peak on chromosome 7. It does contain hints of introgression, but again, we can probably be pretty sure that this is mapping to Ramosa, which again produces phenotypes which are related to tassel branching in other groups of maize. Not that any of the Ramosa mutants or any of the known Ramosa alleles look like this, 
They usually turn things with very large numbers of, of branches to things with slightly fewer. But we can certainly imagine that novel alleles found in Mexican highland maize could produce this phenotype. Again, it doesn't seem to have come from Mexicana. And again, although Mexicana has fewer tassel branches than Parviglumis, it certainly doesn't look like this in any way. Okay, so this is something that seems very unique to this group. And again, why, who knows, you can come up with stories about why this might be useful in the highlands. But it certainly is not something that Mexicana seems to need. But Mexican highland maize has it. And again, initially, we're not seeing any evidence that that's really a trait that's come from there. So I'm going to cheat a little bit now and jump to a different population. This is actually, um, these are B73 by Palomero Tolokenio BC1S5 families. Here we have about 80 of these things that we evaluated in replicated trials in both high and low sites. And in this population here, we wanted to map hairs. We couldn't map hairs because all the plants just about were hairy. Okay, we had very few segregants that didn't produce any hairs. And this is obviously an indication we have multiple possibly redundant loci acting here, and they're probably dominant. So again, you know, if we have no variation, we can't map it. It's easier for us to do that when we have S5s. We now have inbreds. So again, we, we have less confounding effects of dominance, and we do have more variation. So in this population, we are able to successfully map stem hairs, but we do map multiple QTL. And if we look at their effects, they do to seem to be somewhat redundant, at least at the level we're scoring the trait. So again, something like hairs, we're just going and saying that's a hairy plant, or it's got lots of hairs, or quite a few hairs, or no hairs. So if we say that both these alleles can make you hairy, then they're redundant. If we start measuring the lengths or the densities, we, we may see something else going on. Now, the fun thing about hairs is we do get a nice hit here on chromosome 9, which is one of these regions that we've seen before and that has been previously published. So here's a nice hair QTL. Unfortunately, it's not coming out from the Rev PT population. It's coming from the B73 by PT population. This is quite a noisy little panel, but we can sort of pile our data and other people's data on top of each other. Here's chromosome 9 genetic map. Here's our peak from our 80, 80 BC1 uh, S5 families. We get a nice peak at this position on chromosome 9. Here's our QTL interval. Now, here's a previously published by Nick Lauter interval in a Parviglumis by Mexicana F2 population. Okay, so that's telling us that in Mexicana, there is an allele in this place that can make you hairy. It's telling us that in PT, in Palomero Tolokenio, our highland land race, there's an allele in this place that could make you hairy, i.e. consistent with gene flow. Here is our FD trace. It's a bit noisy, but you see it. And we do have quite a lot of events across this position in chromosome 9. Also from Matt's work, I don't show Matt's data on this one, he also has a region of chromosome 9. So now we have evidence that in Mexicana, there's something here that can make you hairy. In Highland Maze, there's something that can make you hairy, and that there has been gene flow between the two. Even better, if you like, this is also, if we look at the genetic position, there's a locus mapped here, a mutant macro hairless one, which in cultivated maize, the mutant loses macro hair production on the leaf blade. Okay, so it's not the same thing, but it's a very related thing. Now, this has not been cloned, but it's been mapped fairly well, and it pretty much lies here. So this is all now sort of comes together to give the kind of story that you might want to see for at least transfer of a trait from Mexicana to Highland maize. Again, is it an adaptive trait? We don't know, but it's certainly in a trait that you see in Mexicana, and you see all Mexican highland maize have these hairs. And again, just to sort of explain what's happening here with this macro hairless idea, really we're seeing a redeployment of the macro hair program. So we have typical maize leaf. We have a sheath domain and a blade domain along the proximal distal axis. We also have an adaxial and abaxial surface if we look at the dorsal ventral axis. So most maize plants, or all maize plants, are producing macro hairs here on the adaxial surface of the blade domain. You don't see abaxial macro hairs. You don't see sheath macro hairs. The little bits of hair you have here are actually a continuation of the margin around the ligule. So these marginal hairs, they don't count. The hairs that Mexicana and other highland maize is producing are these hairs that you see coming around. And here, they really, if I go back again, what you're having to do you're having to move the macro hair program from adaxial to abaxial surface and then pass yourself from the blade into the sheath domain. So effectively, you've redeployed both in the dorsal ventral 
and the proximal distal axis. And again, there are many other examples of maize genes or, or genes from other organisms where we've able to shift whole programs around. Okay, and, and that seems to be what's happening here. So again, I think the evidence suggests that there's a unique macrohelis one allele, which is present in Mexicana, which has also been passed across to Mexican highland maize. And again, perhaps just jumping back, that's great, but we also have this thing that seems to do exactly the same job on chromosome seven, that's not in Mexicana, that hasn't come from Mexicana, and that presumably Mexican highland maize may have invented itself. So even within one accession, we seem to see at least two ways of getting to this, this final point. Here, just to illustrate it, we then have a second donor. This is a, a Conoco accession, Michoacan 21, again, very hairy. And there we map something completely different. So it looks like even these type phenotypes, you know, all Mexican highland maize is hairy. When we start looking at the genetic architecture, there seems to be multiple ways to get there. And we actually have potential convergence even within a fairly restricted geographic area. These are just nils, and this is just highlighting that we can move this trait back. We've now gone five times into B73. And these are, you know, we have a nice series of nils now that we're looking to, to try and clone some of these genes, and that will give us a lot more uh, leverage to understand what's going on in the diversity and then the function of these alleles. So, yeah, doing reasonably well. I thought I would finish with a few comments on this famous chromosome 4 inversion. Okay, so again, quite a lot going on on this slide, but let's see if we can go through it. So here's chromosome 4. This is, again, physical position. Here is the position of inversion 4M. So this is an inversion polymorphism that's been previously mapped either by LD in populations um, or various other, uh, in, in various other analyses. Here we see our signals of introgression and our 10% and 1% outliers. So this is just a a blasting signal that really comes out very strongly. And again, we can concatenate events all the way across this. So this thing is about 10 or so megabases in size. What else do we see here? Here's the actual FD trace. The green trace is what we see in Mexican highlands. So you hit the inversion and suddenly, bam, up goes our trace. Here, if we run the same thing using South American lowland instead of Mexican highland maize, obviously we just get a sort of background signal. We can then see what's happening with our genetic map using our, our F2 population. Again, this is genetic distance, physical distance. So here, we just sort of standard moray plot know that we're growing genetic and physical distance together. As we get closer to the centromere, this flattens out. We pass the centromere, we start growing genetic distance again. But then again, across this putative inversion or this inversion, we basically see no genetic distance in our population. Again, indicative that it is in fact an inversion. And then when you get out of it again, bam, instantly things start going up again. And again, we can just take that as recombination fraction. And again, we have recombination fraction increasing as we come away from the centromere, but then completely drops in this region of the inversion. So putting all this together, you have very nice evidence that there's an inversion polymorphism here, which is present in Mexican highland maize, that it's come from Mexicana. And well, here it is. So what does it do? Now, this thing is a bit of a problem. So the population geneticists love this because it's a massive signal for anything you analyze. Because basically, any cultivated maize plant, any Mexicana plant, after about 2,000-something, 2, 250 meters of elevation, it's fixed. Everyone has this thing. And similarly, as you go down below about 500 meters, it's completely absent. There's some interesting stuff in the middle where it's a bit of both. But effectively, you have this um, very, very strong population structure that really completely confounds any GWAS analysis you want to do. So we also have unique fixed phenotypes. So all Mexican highland maize is hairy. All Mexican highland maize is homozygous for this. And there's, no, and there's really, there's no lowland maize which is hairy. There's no lowland maize that doesn't have this. So it doesn't matter what statistical tricks you try and do, it's very hard. To, to do anything with that. You either completely kill the signature or you have a lot of putative associations which are there. So, I mean, there's very nice, strong results linking this thing to lots of stuff. So we got very excited from our functional point of view. So we took it from Palomelo, Paramelo Toroqueño. We back crossed it four to five times into B73 and nothing happens. Okay, we can't see anything. 
Okay, we grow these plants in the highlands, in the lowlands, in the growth chamber, in seedlings. And basically, we can't see anything at all. Okay, so we can keep thinking of new things we should probably be doing. We can grind them up and we can see genes going up and down. We've done transcriptomics, something is happening. Okay, but there's no magic kind of, you know, it doesn't suddenly become a highland adapted maize variety. Why isn't it removed then if it has no selective advantage? Why well, so the argument is that clearly it does have a selective advantage that we haven't been able to find because this thing has been selected apparently in teosinte populations. It's then been introgressed at very, you know, possibly many times. Subsequently, it's moved to fixation in Mexican highland maize populations. I know for a fact it's in all the best Simit Highland CMLs, it's there. I think it's also true, Pioneer's best Highland hybrids, they have it as well. Not consciously, they've not gone looking for this thing. It just weasels its way in and, it, and, and there it goes. So yeah, why? Um, a lot of things are still doing on that. Um, we have a lot of ideas, we have a lot of things we are trying to do. One thing I'm interested in trying to explore a bit further, and this is, again is very preliminary now, is that it has, doesn't have an additive effect. It needs to interact with other variants which are coming in, that, in those highland populations. I, I, basically, we're looking at epistatic type effects. Now, obviously, epistatic effects are very difficult to capture, especially when, like us, you're working at a very small scale. So, for instance, I told you we were doing a lot of our work in BC1 populations. If we've got 80 BC1 families, it's not very many. If you start requiring how many of those families are homozygous for the inversion and homozygous for any other locus from, from Palomero to Tolokenio, that's one in 16. You know, we're talking three or four families. If someone drives a tractor over one of them, someone doesn't score the other one. Basically, we haven't got the data to see these things. So how can we even start to get hints at this? So one thing we may have indication of is this idea of variance heterogeneity. So when we can't really capture epistasis directly, we can start looking at the variance, and the variance may be informative about what's going on. So again, just to very briefly look at this idea, again, this is not the only data we have on this, but we'll have to bear with me that it's, it may be something. So here we're looking again in this um, Reventador PT, small F2 population grown in the lowlands. And we've got two traits here. One is tassel branch number, and the other is days to emphesis. And I'm comparing plants which are carrying homozygous for the inverted uh, allele at this inversion four, and then the ones carrying the standard plants. So if we look at tassel branch number, and we simply look at effectively any sort of central measure, the mean, median, between these two groups of plants, there's nothing happening. And this is indicative of why we don't find anything in a simple single scan through QTL, for instance. Again, we see a very similar story in days to anthesis. But if we look at the variance, there is an indication that we have a greater variance when the plants are carrying the inversion than when they are not. And this can indicate that the inversion is somehow interacting with other components of that genome to promote phenotypic variation. If we now look at, if we break this down further, and we take our QTL on seven, which was our major QTL for tassel branch number, this probably Ramosa one, and we break it down, we can see, again, it's light indications at the minute. We have more data here. That if we look at the inverted plants, if we look at least at the medians, that the median for the high effect allele at QTL7 is a little bit higher when you carry the inversion. And similarly, the median for the low effect allele is a little bit lower when you carry the inversion. So we're pulling apart the phenotypic classes related to the major effect allele. That's causing our the inflation of the variance. So one way you can think about this thing is that the inversion is somehow capacitating the major effect QTLs. It's enhancing their phenotypic expression. We see again a similar thing going on in days to anthesis. I mean, again, if you just look at the point estimates of the median for now, to bear with me on that. But also there is an indication that within the genotypic classes for our major effect QTL for days to anthesis, which is a weaker QTL, we also see greater variance. You know, the blue boxes are taller than the red boxes. That indicates that potentially there is other further interactions that we're not, we're not taking into account here. And clearly, the, the flowering time architecture, again, is a little more blurred than what we see with the tassel branch numbers. So again, these are, these are very small numbers. And again, if you start saying, well, I need to find a third QTL here, I mean, I can't go and look for you know, third order epistatic interactions in 100 and something F2 plants, it doesn't make any sense. So 
how can we do that? So one way is either we need these enormous populations, which we're not going to have. But if we now have specific hypotheses, we can move forwards and test those using simple genetics. So for instance here, we now have NILs segregating this Q, uh, the QTL on 7 for tassel branch number and the inversion. So we can now go and direct, OK, is this picture actually true? If we bump the numbers right up here, what do we see? Similarly, if we want to scan the genome for unknown interactors of the inversion, we can use a, a HIF strategy, which we're now advancing. This is Alex, a student in the lab, is doing this, whereby basically as we're deriving our new um, BC1S5 RILs, we continually genotype and we select for, uh, for plants which are heterozygous for this inversion. And we keep selfing those heterozygotes. Everything else is becoming homozygous except for that in inversion. And at the end, you self that out, and again, you select the segregant. So now you have a pair of nils with and without the inversion with a common but mosaic background which contains both Palomero and B73 gene content. If you repeat this trick across 100 or so families, you then have a very powerful resource to map epistatic interactions with reference to this particular inversion. Okay. So I think with that, that's pretty much an indication of you know, what we found, but also more than anything, I want to convey the kind of ways that we want to work, that we think we can work, uh, that we're interested in working. And we've seen genome resequencing has mapped substantial introgression. I think obviously as we move towards de novo sequencing of this PT genome, that's gonna be obviously something we're gonna, we're gonna look at again, revisit in more detail. We've seen that the integration has gene density. It has genes in there. We have these very large megabase scale events, which are very attractive because you find them very easily. They're very convincing. But there's also all these little tiny events possibly doing something important. We have at least this one example now of uh, a major QTL for sheath pigmentation, which does co-occlose with an integration region. Again, that's a very nice example. Is that happening for other more complicated traits? Again, we have the infor polymorphism, which is the largest scale and the best supported integration region. It's the one everyone always finds. But at the moment, really, I think it's very difficult to say, what is it actually doing? And again, that's interesting as a question in itself, but I think it's also interesting to see what does that tell us about a lot of these other results and how we, we can or cannot interpret these. So I think basically I want to finish there. I would just like to sort of say that, you know, we continue to grow and cross corn plants because that's what we enjoy doing even though slightly bizarrely we haven't actually got a cornfield, which has given us a lot of headaches over the years. But just one sort of nice example of fun things we're doing is we're making a little magic population. Again, the motivation I think really was because the students wanted to see what the ears would look like. I mean, <laughs> there is some scientific basis, but there's not too much. Well, there is. There's quite a lot, but we'll see. So this was all done with land races. Again, these are outbreds, which means we have to use single F1 individuals to make sure we don't end up with an unholy mess which has made things a little difficult at the beginning. But we, so basically we selected eight land races again, kind of classic land races trying to cover you know, major adaptive regions. We have F1s, we then make double crosses, we then intimate the double crosses, and we, now we have an intimated eight-way population that we've done through two or three cycles. So we'll intimate this one more time this winter, and then we're gonna start selfing this guy down. Okay, and um, it has a lot of phenotypic diversity. It's very cool. Um, there are some very nice things we may or may not be able to do with it. We'll have to see how far we get. At the moment, its main use has been for eating. Apparently, it's very tasty. So every time we go through the cycle, the students throw it on the barbie, and it, it is very tasty. It's much tastier than most corn. So I think with that, I think that's me coming to an end. Yes. But um, there's many other resources like this that we're developing, and certainly we're very interesting to see if, interested to see if people are interested in, in using any of these. Okay, thank you. Uh -huh. <laughs> is there any reason for there being, I mean, a combination being suppressed in that inversion just proximal to that you have very high mm -hmm. in a combination frequency and that doesn't seem like a small inversion. So it's, it's, about, it's about 10 megabases, no? So, yes, I mean, at least with respect to lowland maize, it's, it's, an, it's in chromosomal inversion. So obviously physically the things don't line up properly. And the only way you can recombine there is uh, is by forming these very strange recombination loops, which you normally are going to generate eccentric fragments that will be unbalanced and be lost. 
Is it possible to go back to where this inversion came from and see if you can find some other so the actual of that in the original donor and then interrogate and see what they do? So the, the thought is actually the inversion is actually the ancestral state. And that it's it's pardic lumis that's weird. So if we go out to other Tiocente species, they look inverted as well. So pardic lumis was actually the inverted form, and then that's what's passed into the majority of cultivated maize. Okay. okay um, how much diversity is there within the inversion? That's obviously something we're interested in. Is the inversion more diverse in Mexicana than Highland maize? This would indicate whether this was, for instance, a single event that happened very early in the Highland colonization, and then this spreads, or is this something that just keeps coming in all the time? Um, one way to actually demonstrate genetically the inversion is to cross two inverted but polymorphic haplotypes, and then we can get recombination, we can map within that. So we have enough SNPs between, for instance, the Palomero and one of the Highland Simit lines, CML457, 459, which do carry this inversion. We can see polymorphisms, and we have F2 populations there where we can map within the inversion. And effectively there, if you take the physical position of those markers, for instance, with respect to B73, and you position them against their genetic position, it literally flips. Other questions? Well, we shouldn't let him go off that easy. Denise? So I just want to throw out a fun idea. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, back in the day when I was in graduate school many decades ago, um, a lot of the theses that came out uh, in evolutionary ecology were what we called AS of X, adaptive significance of, and mm -hmm. it was, you know, millions of different things. And uh, one of the things that they were grinding into us is that you can't just tell your just so story. Mm -hmm. You know, you need to show what is the adaptive significance of XYZ. So I think w we have kind of talked about this a little bit informally. Uh, this whole idea of uh, pigmented and furry leaf sheaths. Mm -hmm what is the true right. adaptive mm -hmm. significance of that? And the idea is like, kind of like, oh, they're wearing uh, a, a warm coat mm -hmm. and it's cold up there in the highlands and it's, you know, blah, blah, blah. So I'm just wondering if anyone has tried to do kind of an obvious silly thing is, is um, you know, they have data loggers mm -hmm. with, with uh, um, sensors and everything. Has anyone tried putting a sensor inside the furry? So yeah, I mean, people have done furry. this. Um, but even then, you know, you can show it might show your plant is warmer. That doesn't mean that that's adaptive. It doesn't mean it was selected because you wanted your plant to be warmer. No? Right. So I think we might almost hold judgment there till we understand better the genetic architectures going on. I think a lot of these things may involve interesting pleiotropies. And you might realize that you're mm. furry, but you also have more root hairs. Who knows? and that that was mm -hmm. important, et cetera. So I think a better understanding of the basic genetic, genetic architecture may help us then to go forward and interpret it. And then it. more detailed. And then similarly, I mean, if we, have, yeah, if we have bigger populations so that you can do the, the evaluation more, more convincingly, then you can start to control for certain things. If we fix all the major effect yield QTL, do we see a slight increase if we're furry, for instance? I mean, certainly what you do not do, you don't go and map yield or yield components and find a massive peak on top of the hairs, no? <laughs> so, I mean, those sort of ideas, that just doesn't happen. So, again, if they are effects, they're, they're small and incremental, which, again, I think is something you, we, we have to bear in mind that, you know, a fraction of a percent better may lead to fixation over a couple of thousand years, but for me to go and measure that with a handful of plants is very difficult. Yeah. So, yeah, I think they'll be interesting. One thing we're interested to do actually is to take these um, base populations of this magic and simply grow them for multiple cycles in different places. So again, for instance, this, the inversion is in here. If we, if we just grow that as, in, as an isolation for five, 10 years in Metapec, does the inversion again creep up? Those types of experiments, I think, give a more strong evidence. Or do you find that all the hairy plants are the ones that you, you, you get increased frequency of hairiness, et cetera? Like, so I think there you, you may demonstrate selection more directly. But yeah, what it's actually doing is harder. 
Some questions? Sure. Oh, Kevin has one. Good. Pick up. Just out of curiosity, are these introgressions making the introgression from Mexicana making the genome larger, or just uh, bringing in new allelic diversity? So at some level, we don't know. So when we finish our de novo assembly, clearly that's the sort of thing that would be interesting to see. Um, there are whole genome size estimates. I don't know if we can really map genome size directly to introgression. That's difficult to say. But for instance, something like the inversion at the moment, yeah, you assume it's B73 and it's swap round. If you actually go and sequence and assemble that, what's really in there? You know, has it got a large, a very different gene content, this type of thing? Is it much bigger or much smaller? Um, then I think you would have to do that. I mean, certainly you could estimate genome size on all your rills and try and map genome size to you get big peaks on introgression events that suggest that they're, they're very different. But, but there is data that hylum maze has uh, um, smaller, smaller genome. Smaller genome. And so does, but I think Mexicana actually has bigger genomes, it, twistedly. So yeah, typically highland temperate maize has smaller genomes than tropical maize. And those they can map to major, you know, heterochromatic regions. Again, whether those would be particularly likely or less likely to introgress, I mean, I guess you could, you could have a look. One very agronomically important trait you showed was the tessel uh, branch mm -hmm. number. And you seem to just explain it by the Mosa, variants of Mosa or something like that, because in the US, hybrid corn, uh, you, I'm sure you're aware of Dubik's work and all that, mm -hmm. that tessel is essentially just single branch right, right. or a couple branches. And here I notice the hybrids, they're kind of like mm -hmm. humongous. So can you suggest something to similar breeders to just focus on that one single QTL to reduce the uh, tassel size? Well, again, I mean, you have this major effect, but again, tassel branch is quantitative. There are many loci contributing to that. So, um, I mean, it's also interesting. It's not just the lack of branching. It has that kind of chunky tassel. No, there are technical words to be used here. Um, they're interesting. There are unbranched mutants of maize. This was Sarah Hake's lab originally come up with these. And they have a couple of those which look exactly like Palomero tolokenio. And what's interesting there is that it is pleiotropic because it also affects the number of rows of kernels. And so when you reduce tassel branching, you get more rows. So that's a sort of logical consequence of how the meristem branching is working. And it actually starts to look more like a little popcorn. But again, if we go and map these things, we, we see nothing hitting the unbranched loci. Mm -hmm. So it looks like, we, again, we get to the same place in different ways, which I think, again, is a, is a general theme which is of interest. Any last question? If not, let's thank Rory once oh, again. And welcome our next speaker, Ruben Rayan. He's also at Lan Habio, also moving to the USA next year to North Carolina State. Ruben got his uh, bachelor's and master's degrees at the Universidad Autonoma de Madrid and then his PhD at uh, Olade uh, Experimental Station in Zaragoza and did a postdoc at Carnegie Institute. Uh, has been uh, studying iron root architecture at Carnegie, right? Yep. In uh, Spain, it was more on the uh, iron uh, uptake and deficiency type of work. So he's going to give us another dimension of this maze adaptation, which is uh, metabolic uh, diversity and uh, elasticity in the maze adaptation. I think I got it right, your title. Is that? More or less. Still the, the is your Rory's. Are, are you guys putting on my? Okay. Oh, there. So, so. You are. You have his presentation on? Ah, there. There we go. Okay. Now I can. Uh, Phospholipid balance as a possible driver of maize adaptation to highlands. Sure. I was, I think I was pretty close. Yeah. <laughs> it's all yours, Ruben. Go ahead. All right. 
Well, thank you. Thank you for the, for the invitation, Sarah. Uh, it's certainly a, a great pleasure to come uh, here uh, uh, to CIMIT, from which uh, we have great collaborators. We get a lot of uh, our genetic resources, uh, a lot of our data as well. And uh, it truly is uh, uh, special to, uh, to come here and, and tell you about uh, our work. So, um, uh, luckily, uh, Rudy spoke before me, so I'll be able to, to go quickly uh, over a lot of the, uh, the things that I wanted to tell you. Uh, but I will be focusing today uh, on, on this idea of how uh, a metabolic trait uh, might be uh, a possible driver of maze adaptation uh, uh, to highlands. Uh, so uh, our main interest is in understanding at the molecular level uh, how uh, plants adapt to local environments by uh, modulating their uh, metabolic pathways. So uh, on this cartoon, and very simply, uh, so here we have this plant that is adapted to these low elevations uh, and then makes it to the highlands. And if uh, there is in this metabolic pathway a mutation that leads to an increase, for example, on this uh, metabolite A, and this increase in metabolite A will help uh, in the adaptation to highlands. Uh, this mutation will be selected for uh, in the uh, new environment. So we'll see uh, a differentiation uh, on this allele, and usually this is accompanied by uh, loss of uh, diversity around that, uh, that allele, and uh, using a number of um, statistical tests, we can uh, identify uh, uh, these regions. So uh, particularly, we're interested in understanding how highland adaptation shape uh, phospholipid metabolism and its possible effect on, on maize adaptation to highlands. I'm going to uh, skip uh, this, uh, this whole thing, how uh, maize was domesticated uh, in, the, in the lowlands here of, of the Balsas Valley uh, from, uh, uh, from Parvi Glumis, and how then it made it to the, to the highlands and received a significant introgression from uh, Mexicana. For me, the most amazing idea here is how this C4 uh, tropical plant uh, was able then to make it to these uh, very cold uh, environments and today is, is cultivated all over the world. Uh, as you may know, lowland maize uh, also moved to South America uh, following a, a lowland route. And uh, after getting to South America, uh, it also colonized uh, highland territory here in the Andes. So this is a, an, an interesting uh, system to uh, study uh, uh, convergence or divergence because basically we have two independent of events of uh, adaptation to similar environments. So uh, what I'm going to try uh, to convince you now or give you hints about the possible adaptive significance Thank you, Denise, for introducing that idea to me of why uh, changes in phospholipid me metabolism uh, might be uh, important uh, in the process of uh, adaptation uh, to highlands. So uh, very brief uh, biochemistry class here. Uh, uh, phospholipids are a class of glycerolipids, and they are essential building blocks of uh, membranes. So glycerolipids, they are made of uh, a glycerol 3-phosphate uh, uh, backbone, and then uh, we have these uh, fatty acids, and then uh, depending of the polar head precursors, uh, we can make different glycerolipids. So if you have a, a phosphocholine a moiety here, we, call, uh, we talk about phospholipids. If we uh, lose one of these uh, fatty acids, then we have uh, lysophospholipids, but then we also have uh, galactolipids and sulfolipids that contain a, a sulfate a moiety here. And, a lot, and some of these uh, uh, glycerolipids are essential uh, intermediates, uh, such as phosphatidic acid and, and uh, diacetylglycerol. So uh, phospholipids constitute 25% of the available phosphorus in a cell, and they are involved in a number of processes related uh, with uh, abiotic and uh, biotic stress. Uh, most of the phosphorus, though, is in the form of nucleic acids, RNA, uh, DNA, etc. So I'm going to touch a little bit on, on, on how plants respond to, uh, uh, to phosphorus deficiency. There are three main strategies. Uh, 
uh, when plants are grown under uh, low phosphorus uh, conditions. The main one is to try to recover as much of the uh, low phosphorus that might be available uh, in the rhizosphere, so plants excrete uh, phosphatases to make this phosphorus more available. And then uh, there is an up regulation of transporters of, uh, of uh, phosphorus, uh, transporters in the root to be able to acquire uh, more phos phosphate from the rhizosphere, but also uh, these transporters are uh, upregulated throughout the different tissues of, of the plant. But once uh, phosphorus is inside the plant, uh, there is this uh, recycling uh, strategy where you try to use the phosphorus that is already uh, available on the plant, and usually plants do this in, in older leaves. So they'll take these compounds, such as uh, uh, proteins or, or phospholipids in our case, they will degrade them in these older leaves to free up phosphorus that can then move to uh, meristems uh, where it's needed uh, to synthesize new proteins, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, so this, uh, this is what we call phosphorus use efficiency. Make the best of the phosphorus that you have already uh, taken. And of course, there, uh, the metabolism of uh, phospholipids is, uh, is very important. So under low phosphorus, uh, what plants do is they tend to decrease uh, the concentration of phospholipids to free up uh, these phosphate groups. And they substitute these phospholipids in the brain brains by other uh, glycerolipids that don't contain uh, phosphate uh, uh, in their structure. Uh, typically, these are uh, sulfolipids and uh, galactolipids. And uh, we know that uh, soils with low phosphorus availability are uh, particularly common uh, in American mountain ranges. Uh, this is especially true here in the Trans-Mexican uh, volcanic belt. Uh, these are uh, volcanic soils, mainly uh, andosols. And these andosols are of low pH values uh, where uh, phosphorus is highly retained uh, in the soil and therefore uh, is, is low available to the plant to, uh, to take up. So we, we know that there is a positive correlation between uh, elevation and uh, retention uh, of phosphorus. So the higher the, uh, the, eleva the elevation, the more common these, these soils uh, become, and the lower uh, phosphorus availability. So we also know from uh, basic work, uh, and mainly in, in, in Arabidopsis and other species, that phospholipids respond uh, to cold. So uh, what plants do, they, they tend to increase the concentration of phospholipids and decrease the concentration of these other uh, glycerolipids such as uh, sulfolipids and galactolipids. And uh, the theory is that these phospholipids are more polar than these other uh, uh, glycerolipids. So when you, when you want to adapt to colder environments, you still want to maintain a membrane fluidity. So you want to make your membranes with, uh, at the end of the day, uh, uh, something that is more uh, there is more polar to maintain that uh, membrane uh, fluidity. Uh, we know that cold has a big effect on, on development and, and therefore on flowering times. Uh, so this is data from uh, the population that uh, Rudy was showing uh, before, uh, B73 and uh, Palomero Tolucano. So you see here that it takes basically, regardless of the, of the genotype, it takes two to three times longer to make a maize plant in highland conditions than in, lower, uh, in lowland conditions. And this, at the end of the day, has to do with the accumulation of uh, growth degree units. So you need to accumulate a number of these units to, to, to make it uh, to flowering. And that depends on the, on the maximum or minimum temperature where you're growing. And therefore, it's colder in the, uh, in the highlands, so you need uh, uh, more time to accumulate the same uh, growth degree units. We think that this fast flowering is probably associated with uh, aerial biomass allocation. And uh, this has been, the, the farmers here in the Highlands know this. Uh, this has been shown by people working here like eagles a long time ago. Highland maize has a higher shoot to root ratio. Uh, this is data, uh, again, from Palomero Tolucano, uh, B73, and a tropical uh, seamid line. 
and here we're looking at the shoot to root ratio and this uh, ratio uh, is much higher uh, in Palo Merito Canyon. This is one of the reasons that uh, this highland, uh, uh, highland maze tends to lodge in the field. Um, this is true uh, in highlands of Mesoamerica, but also highlands from uh, South America. So this is a, a big panel of uh, highland and lowland maize from Mesoamerica and South America. And we can see here that uh, the highlands have a higher uh, shoot-to-root uh, uh, ratio. So what, what farmers do here typically is they tend to, uh, to plant deeper and then they tend to heal, heal up the plants. So uh, over two to three times uh, uh, during the growing season, they, they go to the field and heal up the, uh, uh, the plant. There still must be lodging, I would say. Because even with the B73, low ratio like 40 to 30 percent of uh, the biomass being removed instead of like 5 to 10 percent, you still see root lodging. So yeah. Issue. Yeah, and in, in our fields where we don't heal necessarily or plant deep, yeah, Palomero Tolucano rows are always a, a bit of a, a disaster, regardless of where you grow them. Uh, but coming back to, to, uh, uh, to flowering time, uh, there is data showing uh, that the lipid composition has actually a high flowering time uh, uh, predictive uh, 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 power. Uh, so this is uh, correlations between uh, individual lipids and the general combining uh, ability values for uh, flowering time. And uh, we see a nice uh, correlation of uh, the, the predicted general combining ability for flowering time and the observed uh, general combining ability for flowering time when we use uh, lipid composition. At the molecular level, uh, and at least in Arabidopsis, uh, this uh, has been uh, nicely shown uh, through this uh, interaction of uh, phosphatidylcholine. So phosphatidylcholine is the most abundant uh, phospholipid. And the group of George Kuplan, they have shown that phosphatidylcholine binds to uh, flowering locus T, and this binding uh, accelerates uh, flowering. So they did this uh, nice uh, trogenic approach where they had uh, inducible lines where they could play with the phosphatidylcholine and phosphatanolamine uh, ratio. So these are, these are the, transgenic, uh, the transgenic lines. Uh, this is the wild type. And just by changing very little this ratio, going from 2.5 to 3 or so, uh, there is uh, an acceleration of um, uh, flowering time uh, in, the transgenic, uh, in the transgenic lines. Mechanistically, they don't know exactly how this, this works. Uh, they think that these uh, phosphatidylcholine, they can form vesicles that surround uh, this transcription factor and uh, allowing the transcription factor to be transferred to the nucleus uh, more efficiently, but, but, it, but it's not clear. Uh, but there is this, uh, uh, this connection between uh, phospholipid content and, and flowering time, and acceleration of flowering time. And finally, uh, a phospholip phospholipid breakdown provides uh, polyunsaturated fatty acids. So when, it's, it's, when we have these phospholipids, it's, breaking, it's broken into this lysophospholipid phospholipid and these fatty acids. And this is the first step of uh, uh, gesmonic acid uh, production. And as you know, gesmonic acid uh, is involved in response to defense and uh, the biotic pressures that, 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 you, that you face in the highlands and the lowlands are, are, are very different. So all these uh, possible adaptive significant explanations uh, uh, led us to the uh, hypothesis that phospholipid metabolism was under selective pressure and was important to make uh, adaptation to highlands. So how we, do we go about this to, uh, to test these ideas? Uh, so we do by parental and diversity panel mapping populations. Uh, that we then grow in common garden experiments in contrasting environments, highlands and lowlands. Uh, we do biochemical phenotyping. The phenotype that we care about are the concentrations of uh, these uh, glycerolipids. And then we use quantitative and population genetics to identify regions that might be uh, spreading variation in these biochemical uh, phenotypes. 
And at the end of the day, we go back to do reverse generic and heterologous expression uh, to functionally validate uh, uh, the, the function of uh, the candidate genes. So uh, one of the uh, diversity panels that we're working with, uh, this is part of the, of the Highland Adaptation Project that Rudy briefly touched before, uh, is this diversity panel made of uh, 60 Mesoamerican uh, uh, land races and 60 South American uh, land races. Half of them are highlands, half of them are lowlands, and they are selected in pairs. So for each highland uh, land race, you have a lowland land race that is within uh, half a degree of uh, latitude. Uh, so this is just uh, a land races that we ordered here from, uh, uh, from CIMIT. Uh, we uh, wanted to cover a nice uh, latitudinal range. We uh, uh, ordered the seeds, and then we uh, planted them in these uh, common garden experiments. And the other population that we have been mainly working with is this uh, B73 by uh, Palomero Tolucano back cross uh, inbred lines that uh, Rudy mentioned before. Um, so our, our sites are this lowland site uh, in Valle de Banderas, uh, here in Nayarit, right next to uh, Puerto Vallarta. And uh, the highland site is the, is the Simit uh, uh, Toluca site uh, in Metepec. So this is at sea level. This is 2,600 meters above uh, sea level. Uh, so this is how how the uh, lowland side looks, and, and this is the, uh, the, the beautiful uh, Metapec uh, site. Uh, growth degree units here, 15, here, uh, three times less. Uh, so we grow the plants, and we usually sample uh, relatively early, uh, B4 or big seas. Um, so we sample the youngest fully developed leaf. So uh, these, uh, these phenotypes change very quickly, right? They, they, they change uh, uh, during the day. Actually, on the previous uh, paper that I showed you on the binding of phosphatylcholine uh, to FT, the uh, species of phosphatylcholine that, uh, choline that bind to FT are only produced during the night, not during the day. So for us, it's very important to sample uh, very quickly and then also sample at the same time uh, uh, in the different fields. So we usually sample uh, four, uh, four hours after, after the sun uh, has come up, and we try to, uh, to sample very quickly. So we, and then it's important to freeze also very quickly this, uh, uh, this sample, because then, the, of course, the, 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 the sample, the, the, your compound might degrade, et cetera. So we go to the field with uh, liquid nitrogen, with dry ice, et cetera, and we've now, with a team of, um, of seven people, we can sample 600 samples in about 80 minutes, okay? So we flash freeze them, uh, freeze them in, in, in liquid nitrogen, and then we transport them uh, to, the, uh, to the lab uh, uh, in dry ice. But it's kind of a stress. Do you randomize the order? Yeah, the, 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 the lines in the field, they are, they are, they are randomized. Uh, we, uh, we have replicas in different blocks, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. So when you come back to a site, you use the same order? Like the no, partic order. no particularly, yeah. Uh, so then we get into the lab, we, we, we struck them, we smash them up, and then uh, the, uh, the analysis is done with uh, HPLC, uh, uh, liquid chromatography, and identification is done with uh, QTOF uh, and SMS. So we do this in collaboration um, uh, with uh, Oliver Fing at UC Davis. So Carla, who is the student that has been uh, mainly working on this, um, does destruction in the lab, and then the samples are shipped to, uh, to Davis. Carla is shipped to Davis, and she does the, uh, uh, the analysis there. What time of the day you collect this, like midday or morning? Uh, four hours after, after dawn. Four hours so, after so typically 10, 10, 10 a.m., something like that. Yeah, but then the samples are randomized, so you, you're equally likely to collect a lowland land race at the beginning of your sampling than at the end of your sampling. So, yeah. uh, I mean, you could all. I suppose you have control of the same plant collected at. We do. We do keep. Now. We do keep track of which sample which was collected first. I mean, we're not timing that, but we know in which order we're in the field, 
and which sample was collected first. So we could use that as a covariate. Uh, we know it's not, at, at that range, it's not really that, that important. Have checks as well. And we have checks as well, yeah. Checks, so we, the parents, we collect them, yeah. And we don't see, uh, the biological variation that we see in the field is, 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 is greater than, 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 the bar, than the variation that might be due to uh, different times. I mean, the alternative would be to have more people uh, uh, collecting uh, the sample, but that also has its complications. You want them to be well trained, etc. Um, so, in that way, I'm relatively happy with what we uh, what we've done so far. So, we can identify around 120 glycerolipid species um, uh, using this uh, uh, this analysis, uh, and I'm going to show you uh, briefly uh, some of the uh, of the data, phenotypic data that we have so far. Uh, for uh, for the uh, for this panel, we recently got uh, the genotypes from uh, uh, from these guys. So this is something that Cesar uh, has been uh, helping us doing here. So we have uh, dart genotypes for the same individual from which we collected uh, tissue for uh, phospholipids. And of course, this uh, this when we collect, it's just a punch. So the plant keeps growing, and we have. Uh, uh, mature plant uh, uh, phenotypes for the same plants as well. Uh, I only show, I'm only going to touch briefly on the, on the phenotypes of these. We're not going to get too much into uh, genotype, uh, uh, phenotype interactions uh, because we just got the, uh, the results back. So one of the most interesting things we found here, uh, although this is uh, still quite noisy, is that phosphatidylcholines and lysophosphatidylcholines, so these type of contains, of compounds are the species that show higher differences between highland and lowland land races. So what we see is that highland land races, and particularly Mesoamerican highland land races, tend to have higher concentrations of phosphatidylcholines and lower concentrations of lysophosphatidylcholines. Okay? This is not as clear uh, in South America. Uh, so since phosphatidylcholines can be converted into lysophosphatidylcholines and vice versa, uh, we can use the ratio uh, uh, between the two of them as, uh, uh, as another phenotype. And this has a number of, of uh, advantages. And people have shown that the ratios between metabolites are a better proxy to then uh, identify significant genotype, uh, uh, phenotype um, uh, associations, because the ratio gives you a better readout of uh, enzymatic activity rather than uh, the total concentration of individual uh, compounds. So here what I'm plotting is the ratio of phosphatidylcholines over lysophosphatidylcholines versus uh, uh, lysophosphatidylcholines. Uh, so you see this pattern here, and I want you to observe that those uh, land races that have a higher phosphatidylcholine to lysophosphatidylcholine uh, ratio are mainly Mesoamerican uh, highlands. And this ratio is mainly due to a very low concentration of lysophosphatidylcholine compounds rather than extreme, uh, extremely high phosphatidylcholine uh, concentrations, okay? Uh, so there is that on the diversity panel. But then we went to this uh, biparental population between B73, a temperate inbred, and an archetypical uh, Mexican highland palomero tolucano. So when we plot the same thing, again, the ratio of phosphatidylcholines over lysophosphatidylcholines, we see that uh, here you can see on, on blue, palomero tolucano in, in red, B73. Palomero tolucano behaves uh, like a typical uh, Mesoamerican uh, highland. Um, and B73 behaves more like a, uh, like a lowland, okay? And you can see here the, uh, the range of phenotypes on the, on the recombinant inbred lines. So then, of course, you can run a QTL analysis uh, with these phenotypes. So we did that uh, using uh, phosphatyl, the sum of all the different uh, phosphatylcholine species, and we can identify up to 25 different phosphatylcholine species. And we uh, identify uh, a major QTL here at the beginning of uh, chromosome 3. When we do the same thing, but uh, using uh, the sum of all the lysophosphatidylcholine uh, species, 
we find exactly the same uh, uh, QTL at the on exactly the same uh, uh, region at the beginning of uh, chromosome 3. Uh, this QTL is uh, robust uh, to the uh, environment. So when we run the QTL using plants that were grown in Metapec or plants that were grown in, 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 in Bayarta, we find the same, uh, the same QTL. There are other uh, QTLs. Uh, for example, this is for the sum of uh, lysophosphatidylcholine species that are only found uh, in highlands. But this major QTL uh, in, at the beginning of chromosome 3 is very robust to the environment. Uh, looking at the few heterozygous that we still have uh, hanging around uh, in, the, uh, in this uh, BC1S5, uh, we see that uh, B73, the B73 allele uh, is dominant. So uh, homozygous B73 uh, phenotype behaves as the, as the heterozygous. Uh, so we then go and, and look at the allelic effects of those reels uh, that at the peak of this QTL are either homozygous B73 or homozygous palomerotoleukenia. So you can see that when you are homozygous uh, B73 here at the peak of the, of, of the QTL, you tend to have lower concentrations of uh, phosphatidylcholines and higher concentrations uh, when you are a homozygous uh, palomerotoleukenia. And you find the reverse scenario uh, when we look at uh, a lysophosphatidylcholine species. High concentrations uh, when you are homozygous B73 at the peak, very low concentrations when you are homozygous palomerotoleukenia at the peak of the, of the QTL. So then the obvious question, is there any candidate gene in that region that makes sense with our biochemical phenotype? I, the, the nice thing about biochemical phenotypes is that you have a pretty clear idea of what you, what you want to look for. Right? It's not like a morphology uh, phenotype that a lot of things might be influencing that, uh, that phenotype. So we look for uh, genes that might convert uh, phospholipids into uh, lysophospholipids. Uh, and uh, indeed, there is a, a gene with predicted phospholipase type A1, gamma 1, uh, that is located right at the, at, the, at the peak of the QTL peak. So depending on what you, where you cut uh, your uh, phospholipids, you can have different types of uh, phospholipases. Phospholipase A1s, they cut this uh, fatty acid here in the SN1 position, and uh, they perform this reaction. So uh, you have a phospholipid, and you produce a lysophospholipid and, uh, and a fatty acid. Now, there are a lot of phospholipases in the, uh, 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 in the genome. Uh, you have up to uh, 75 uh, uh, different genes with uh, predicted uh, phospholipase activity. So if we go and look at the uh, plantseq.org uh, database that Kate here helped uh, develop at, at the Carnegie, we can identify 75 different uh, genes with phospholipase activity, and half of them are phospholipase A1s. So uh, what we did here is uh, uh, we went to the to the B73 expression atlas. So this is a nice resource where uh, folks took B73 and uh, did RNA-seq in close to 80 uh, uh, different tissues. So we plotted the expression of all these uh, phospholipases in all the different tissues. So here you have all the uh, different tissues, and this is the, uh, the expression levels of all these uh, different phospholipases. Uh, so if we clean this a, a little bit, we see that these phospholipases tend to uh, be highly expressed in um, vegetative leaves from B3 to, uh, to B9. And uh, much to our surprise, our candidate phospholipase is very highly expressed. It's one of the most highly expressed uh, uh, phospholipases. Uh, when uh, the, the, the data that I show for this QTL is uh, using the sum of phosphatidylcholines and lysophosphatidylcholines, but so, of course you can also run uh, individual QTLs for each of the individual compounds. And when you do this for uh, some of the uh, lysophosphatidylcholine species, uh, we find 
this second QTL here at the end of, of, of uh, chromosome uh, 5. And uh, we see that in, at, the, at the peak of this QTL, we, have, we can find this gene that actually performs the opposite reaction uh, than, the, than, the phospho, uh, than the phospholipase. So this is a lysophosphatidylcholine acyl transferase. Okay? And uh, interestingly, uh, this uh, locus here seems to be uh, controlled epithetically by the locus at the, at the chromosome 3. So when you are uh, homozygous PT uh, at, the, at the B73, at the, at the chromosome 3 uh, QTL, then uh, you have very low concentrations of uh, lysophosphatidylcholine species, regardless of uh, your genotype at the, at the chromosome 5 uh, uh, QTL peak. Um, so it uh, seems that when you are uh, a palomeritor or can you homozygous, uh, at that QTL in, in chromosome 3, this whole uh, balance is shift to the, uh, uh, to the right. So we hypothesize that this biochemical phenotype, again, might be due to a, a deleterious mutation because in, in, this, in palomero to leukemia, we observe lower concentrations of uh, lysophosphatidylcholine species and higher concentrations of phosphatidylcholine species. So if uh, this gene is uh, performing this reaction, this should be a, a, a deleterious uh, mutation uh, in palomero to uh, Interestingly, uh, in temperate inbreds, uh, B73, MO17, et cetera, under cold conditions, gene expression data supports a, a low PC to LPC ratio. So uh, the phospholipase is upregulated uh, in these uh, temperate inbreds in cold conditions, and the lysophosphatidylcholine acyl transferase transferase is unregulated under cold conditions, pointing to a, a, a possible uh, effect of the, activity, of the combining activity of these enzymes in the response to uh, cold. Uh, using uh, these uh, reels that are either homozygous PT or B, uh, B73, uh, we did a, a first uh, analysis to see if the expression uh, changes. And it seems that it, uh, this is very preliminary data, but we don't see uh, big uh, obvious changes uh, in the expression uh, of this gene when uh, you are homozygous PT versus when you are homozygous P73. Uh, so th then we went to and sequence uh, the PT allele using these, uh, uh, these reels. Now these are homozygous, so you can take the reel that you know is homozygous uh, a PT at that region, so we sequence the PT allele, and we found a number of both uh, non-synonymous and synonymous uh, SNPs that could affect uh, the enzyme function. Uh, we are particularly interested on this uh, isolation to bailing uh, a mutation here, and mainly because of the location of, of the mutation. It's not a big mutation, but mainly uh, to the location. So this is uh, located on what is called the, uh, the flap lead domain uh, that a lot of these uh, phospholipases uh, contain. So uh, this flap lead domain basically allows to uh, closes and opens the, the, the catalytic side of the uh, or enzyme, allowing the, the substrate to get into the catalytic side. So we think that uh, mutations in the flap lead might have a big effect on the, on the, on the, on the activity of the enzyme. Uh, so then we ask, is this mutation also conserved uh, in other highland maize? And for this, uh, we use a nice data set of... Uh, Were there any other changes? Because that is only synonymous change. I mean, I to granny and it's just it's not, it's, not a big, it's not a big mutation, but we think uh, it might be important because of the, of the location of that mutation on that flap lead domain. Did you find any other, other non-synonymous changes at the administrative level? Uh, there, there are other non-synonymous uh, mutations here and there. I mean, we don't have big deletions or, or uh, any major things here. They are just non-synonymous mutations, but there are a number of them. This is the, because of the location, this is the most uh, uh, interesting one for us. Uh, so then we ask, is this mutation conserving other highland maize? 
and for that uh, we use uh, data generated uh, uh, in the lab of our collaborator Mahafor. So these are uh, 30 uh, maizeland races from highland regions, uh, from, from four highland regions, southwest US, Mexican highlands, Guatemala, and the Andes, and two lowland regions. So these were sequenced at about 30x. Uh, so we went to look uh, at this mutation, and we see that this mutation is uh, fixed uh, in all uh, North American, Mesoamerican uh, uh, highland maize. It is segregated, though, in, 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 in the southwest U.S., but it seems to be fixed uh, in Mexican highlands and, and Guatemalan highlands. So this is the PT allele. G is the PT allele. And then all the Mexican lowland, all the South American highlands, South American lowlands contain the B73 uh, allele. Uh, if we go to a map, uh, from the few uh, 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 genomes that we have there of uh, Parpiglomis and, and, and Mexicana, we can observe that this uh, uh, mutation is actually still segregating uh, uh, in Parpiglomis, and uh, the Teosinte Mexicana contains the, uh, the, the PT uh, allele. So then using uh, uh, the data that uh, Ruri was uh, talking before, we performed this ABA-BABA test, and the data suggests that uh, for this locus, uh, this uh, could actually be uh, the result of uh, introgression from Mexicana rather than selection from standard variation in uh, Parabiglumis. Uh, so we then uh, use uh, the seeds uh, GBS data that was uh, generated uh, here uh, uh, in CIMIT and that was published in, uh, in collaboration with uh, the group of uh, Buckler last year. So this is a nice data set for almost 4,000 land races. Uh, and we, we, we look, this allows us to look uh, more broadly at selection to highlands in the phospholipase gene. Uh, so together with uh, Dan Gates at uh, Jeff Ross Ibarra's uh, group, uh, ran a PCA adapt uh, analysis. So this is a PCA analysis that is trying to identify uh, which environmental uh, uh, variables are driving uh, uh, selection. Uh, so here I'm plotting the, uh, the loadings of the first principal component and the first principal component uh, seems to be uh, explaining mainly uh, variation in altitude and this is something that, uh, uh, that Sarah, uh, Sarah Hearn here already found in the, in the, in the, in the previous paper, uh, paper that I showed you. So here we have peaks that uh, are related with selection to uh, highlands. Okay. So if we uh, zoom in into, the, into chromosome 3 and we zoom uh, even further uh, here uh, in the region of our, our favorite uh, candidate gene, uh, we see a very clear sign of selection uh, with altitude. And all those SNPs that you see here actually fall uh, within the CDS of the, of the phospholipase uh, gene. So all these SNPs are correspond to this, uh, to this peak. Um, so for example, we, di we didn't capture this particular SNP on the, on the GBS, but we did capture uh, other SNPs that we had uh, identified when we did the Sanger sequencing of the, of the PT. So for example, if we look at this, uh, at this uh, SNP, we see that the PT allele is much more frequent at higher elevations uh, than the B73 allele. And this is the case for all the SNPs that we found uh, uh, within the, uh, the, the, the CDS. The PT allele is always at higher frequencies, uh, uh, at higher altitudes than the B73 allele. So then uh, using these uh, this, uh, 30X uh, genomes, we ask if glycerolipid pathway is, as a whole, were under selection uh, in highland maize. So again, here we went to plan sick again, and we identify uh, 210 genes that are related with glycerolipid pathway genes. And then uh, in collaboration with uh, Li Huang at, at Mahafor's lab, uh, we run this FST uh, base population bran branch access statistic that allow us to identify uh, regions that are uh, under selection uh, with highlands. So here you compare with, uh, uh, with parvigloomis and alolan, and this allows you to identify regions 
uh, under selection uh, in highlands. So you can look for selection at, uh, in the different populations. So when we compare uh, the, the PBE statistic, uh, the medium P PBE statistic of our, all our glycerolipid pathway rated genes, and we compare it with a null expectation, uh, we see that glycerolipid pathways show higher PBE, uh, PBE value than the natural expectation. So uh, glycerolipid pathways uh, in general were under selection in all four highland populations. So we then look for, um, for which genes were under selection in at least three of the highland uh, populations. And we see that the majority of the genes uh, under selection in three populations code for genes that are involved in the synthesis or degradation of phosphatidylcholine and phosphatidic acid uh, compounds. And this includes our two favorite uh, uh, genes that I showed you before. So uh, these phospholipase genes were under selection in the southwest U.S., Mexico, and Guatemala, and this relates very well with the, with the data that I showed you before. And the lysophosphatylcholine acyl transferase is actually uh, selected in all four highland uh, populations. So again, this tells us that the, 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 the balance, uh, how we control the balance of phospholipids, lys uh, uh, lysophospholipids was uh, under selection in in all four, high, uh, four highland populations. Uh, so something that we are uh, specifically testing now is this uh, possible uh, uh, involvement of uh, low phosphorus uh, availability. So uh, as I told you before, uh, this in the, in the Trans-Mexican volcanic belt is characterized by volca volcanic soils with high phosphorus retention. So a new student that has joined the lab has been working on uh, extracting uh, from uh, available data uh, phosphorus retention data. So he uh, wrote a, uh, an R package that allows you to basically query uh, phosphorus retention data uh, based on, on, on soil maps. Uh, so with that, you can uh, plot this generalized phosphorus retention potential map so you, cl you can classify all the maps in the world in, in low retention and very high retention. And here uh, you can see that the Trans-Mexican Volcanic Bell is characterized with, uh, uh, by uh, very high uh, retention soils. So then what we did is we went back again to the SITS uh, data set and uh, we basically ran an environmental GWAS uh, using uh, these georeference uh, learn rates and the corresponding uh, phosphorus retention value for each uh, uh, location from which the, the, the land races uh, come from. Uh, uh, so here, uh, I'm not showing uh, all the chromosomes, but actually the main peak of this analysis is again in version four. <laughs> uh, and we think that the, um, there is, again, a population structure uh, a problem going on there because most of uh, these uh, high retention soils are, again, located in these highland regions on which the inversion has been fixed, right? So, uh, again, as Rudy was explaining, this is something that is very difficult to, uh, uh, to, to break apart unless you uh, go back to unstructured populations, you generate these HIFs, NILs, and specifically test the the region that you want to test in the particular conditions that you want to test. In our case here, uh, would be uh, a phosphorus availability. But when we uh, and focusing here uh, again on, on chromosome three, and uh, again we get this uh, nice peak on the same uh, SNPs uh, that fall in the in the CDS of the of the phospholipase, pointing to a possible role of uh, uh, this phospholipase in the response to uh, phosphorus deficiency. But again, this phosphorus de deficiency is highly, is tightly correlated uh, with uh, altitude and other variables. Uh, so we see here that the uh, homozygous AA alleles, the PT alleles, uh, that have uh, high peer retention are actually private to highland Mexican uh, uh, land races. There are other soils that 
have high retention that we are not plotting here, but the PT alleles are private to this, uh, uh, to this uh, uh, highland uh, Mexican area. Uh, so to finish up, uh, we haven't found yet the, the, the adaptive, what is it? The adaptive significance, so uh, I showed you uh, at the beginning uh, a number of possible uh, explanations of how uh, the, the, this phospholipid uh, balance might affect a number of traits that might be involved uh, in adaptation to, uh, uh, to highlands. Uh, but we, we have seen that uh, phospholipid, uh, the phospholipid uh, balance and the genes that control for phospholipid uh, balance uh, was under, uh, under selection. We can identify genes that are explaining this, uh, uh, this variation using uh, an, an structure uh, populations. So now what we are trying to, uh, to do, now that we have candidate genes, is uh, mutate these genes or uh, take these, uh, these favorite regions and actually test uh, in high uh, low phosphorus, cold, uh, temperature, et cetera, if they have an effect on these possible, uh, um, on these possible uh, traits. Right? So that's what we are uh, working on uh, right now. Uh, so with that, thank uh, funding from Conocit, UC Mesos, uh, uh, SIMDA staff. I know officially part of the NSF grant, but I benefit in many ways <laughs> from the uh, Highland Adaptation uh, 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 Grant. And it does take a whole village to, uh, to grow maize. And uh, I, I mainly want to thank uh, uh, Rory. When, when I got there, I was able to do all the things that, I, that, I, that, that I'm doing now mainly because of all the work that Rudy put before, all the mistakes that he did before, we didn't have to make them again. Uh, uh, my lab uh, is quite small. Um, Carla did most of the phospholipid analysis. Uh, Fausto is working on these environmental gibos with phosphorus. And Juan Estevez is uh, working on, on heterologous expression of uh, this gene uh, uh, in Arabidopsis. We now have CRISPR out the phospholipase gene uh, we have uh, insertional mutants, at least one for the lysophosphatylacyl uh, transferase gene. Uh, so that's where uh, we are heading right now. All the Halan Adaptation uh, Project uh, group, uh, Denise has been uh, fundamental uh, to uh, allow the, uh, the, the, the trials on the, on the, on the Metapec site. Oliver, uh, has uh, allowed us to, uh, uh, to run the, the, the phospholipid analysis. And with Dave Jackson and Christoph Benning, we are uh, working more closely, again, on the functional uh, uh, validation of these uh, candidate genes. So thanks again. We'll finish with another beautiful picture of a highland, <laughs> of a highland field. And as I said before, we are moving to uh, NC State uh, next year. And we're looking for graduate students and portal. Questions for Ben? I'll, I'll break the eye. Oh, Kate! You came through finally. <laughs> um, I was just wondering what the soil phosphorus conditions are like in the two sites where you were doing the sampling. Yeah, so uh, in principle, uh, the Metapec site um, should be. should be here in this pocket of uh, very uh, uh, high retention uh, phosphorus, so low phosphorus availability. But uh, I know Fernando takes good pride on fertilizing and treating very well the, uh, their fields. So uh, at the end of the day, neither, so in both fields, we are growing the plants at the best agronomical conditions. So none of them should have uh, a, any phosphorus deficiency together with the needs. We've explored the, the, the possibility of uh, growing in more wild uh, sites. The problem of wild sites is that sometimes they're very wild. So, for example, we have a sad experience of growing big field, 3,000 lines, three rows, uh, 3,000 rows in a, in a beautiful Michoacan highland site where we knew there's a, 
low phosphorus uh, availability. But then the cows enter the enter the site and they didn't make any distinction between genotypes, destroyed everything. <laughs> so, uh, I mean, it takes quite a bit of effort to develop these populations, put these populations in the field. So you want to be able to go back to the field and measure something, right? And we've been able to do this mainly in the Metapec side and in, in the lowland side. In the lowland side, it's the same. Uh, you, you should expect more insect pressure of chewing uh, insects, etc., in lowland sites. But they, they are really nicely sprayed, so you don't get a lot of uh, uh, insect, pr insect pressure. So we think that what we are mainly looking at in these sites is a, is a different in, in temperature. Uh, maize tends to be uh, quite locally adapted, mm -hmm. and uh, the CIMIT breeding programs reflect that because uh -huh. we have a program here in Mexico, we have a separate one in Colombia, in Ethiopian highlands, um, Kenya, uh, Kenya and Zimbabwe, um, India, uh -huh. China, whereas <clears throat> Wheat tends to be very broadly adapted, so we can have one centralized program here that uh -huh. breeds wheat for the world. So, so what does this say about broad adaptation? Broad, uh, adapt broad adaptation versus local adapt adaptation. So yeah, here, I mean, with maize you have this, as you say, it has adapted pretty much to every, every continent, but at the same time you can see uh, very clear signs of uh, local adaptation at the land race level, but also uh, in breeding programs, as you say. CIMIT has their lowland uh, program here in Mexico, or in Kenya, et cetera, et cetera. But also the big companies, Pioneer, et cetera, they have their own. Uh, so this comes again to, uh, to this idea that uh, Rudy was touching on before, on how from this very uh, uh, reduce uh, genetic uh, diversity after domestication and bottleneck. You've been able to to uh, find new epistatic interaction, uh, uh, interactions that allow uh, maize to colonize pretty much all the world. But in each environment, these these uh, these interactions are very unique, right? And you can find as the, the, the example of pigments is a good one. All highland maize is, is, is pigmented, but there are many ways to, uh, to be uh, uh, pigmented. So uh, at the metabolic uh, pathway levels, this is something that uh, I am very interested in, in, in study, uh, using these ideas of convergence, uh, divergence to uh, sites uh, that, are, uh, that are similar, and at the same time, uh, very different. Again, the genetic pool that uh, uh, maize had, had to rely on to adapt to uh, the Andes was even much more reduced because of founder effects, et cetera, et cetera, as uh, maize move uh, southward than the, the genetic diversity that was available uh, uh, here in, in Mexico when maize made it to the, uh, to the highlands. Other questions? Oh, I have one. Sure. The, uh, if possible like this, the one you share that seems to be responsible for cleaving that second um, lipid fatty acid off. That doesn't that mean that there is only one fatty acid left on that lip on the gastrolipid. On the, so, on the so, yeah, so the so what the, the phospholipid paste does is uh, it cuts the fatty acid on the uh, S, on the SN two position. Yes, and then you end up with a lysophospholipid that contains a single uh, fatty acid, yes. Right, so how does that affect the membrane fluidity and all that? On what? Membrane fluidity, membrane. So in principle, uh, plants so tend to not to like to use uh, lysophospholipids to make, uh, to make their membranes, but in theory, it should make it more, uh, uh, more, uh, more fluid because you have, a, you have one less uh, fatty acid. So the, your whole thesis is that this is a mechanism to recycle phosphorus and phosphorus deficient soils. It could okay. be. It could be an explanation. For example, we know a, a paper that just came out last year showed that the the 
orthologue of this lysophosphatidylcholine acyl transferase explains the phosphorus uptake in Arabidopsis when the plants are grown in zinc deficiency conditions. And this is uh, uh, this uh, lysophosphatidylcholine acyl transferase actually interacts on, on ways that are not uh, still very uh, very clear uh, with uh, phosphate transport. We can discuss uh, in detail later. Other questions? One more. Come on, guys. It was a little technical. You could I can understand it's more on the back mystery side, but still it had broader implications like in uh, adaptation and all that. So there should be some questions on the adaptation side, if not on back mystery side. Now I'm, I'm curious about, I mean, at your Simba staff, Langevio lab, you have a lot of work on phosphorus. Uh, and I'm wondering if this is seen as a, a strategy for developing phosphor, low, low phosphorus tolerant or more phosphorus efficient uh, maize germplasm. And you know, what's been thought about and what's been tried? Yeah, as, 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 as Rory was mentioning, I mean, we come to this from a more uh, basic research uh, point of view. So we, we, are, not, we are not breeders. Uh, we certainly generate uh, lines that, in principle, could be used uh, uh, in breeding programs. And we're very happy for, for, pe for people to, to take them on. Uh, we're doing some uh, collaboration with some small comp seed companies. Uh, here in Mexico, in terms of the of the of the of the obvious use, we would argue that uh, building on this uh, genetic diversity, uh, working with uh, with a crop, is a faster way to uh, transfer this uh, uh, this knowledge about uh, natural variation and the and the mechanistic uh, uh, knowledge of how plants respond to uh, to phosphorus that say. Uh, Arabidopsis, and, and there's been quite a bit of work in, in our institute on how uh, Arabidopsis, actually Columbia Zero, <laughs> responds to, uh, uh, to, uh, to phosphorus uh, uh, deficiency. So in the back of our minds, uh, yes, uh, this is the idea of first understanding what is the genetic variation that might have been selected for, uh, for these uh, locally uh, adapted uh, land races growing in these regions with low phosphorus, how we can uh, identify and isolate that uh, uh, genetic variation, and then uh, in the future how that could be used uh, uh, by breeders, uh, uh, etc. But we are not we are not we're not breeders. I mean, we, we certainly can. Uh, we try to uh, understand what breeders are looking for and what. Uh, molecular biologists are, uh, are, look, are looking for. So in a way, uh, uh, we think that uh, th there is value in trying to cross that, uh, to cross that bridge between the two, the two sides of the, of the, of the spectrum. Okay, oh, Lucero has one. I th would have thought you would have all the questions back in Land have you? So, uh, um, Ruben, phospholip is a very important part of the chloroplast, especially the thylakoid membrane. Yes. I wonder if this, um, um, how the fluidity of the membrane change affect photosynthesis, and have you seen any relationship between photosynthesis and the different compositions of phospholipids in the highlands? And yes. So, so yeah, actually, the, the, the phospholipids are particularly abundant on chloroplast uh, membranes, as uh, Lucero was saying. Um, we have uh, 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 started a, a small core uh, collaboration with a group at, at, at UNAM, at the, at the Facultad de Química. Uh, so they are experts on, on, on how to measure membrane fluidity, etc., and their role of uh, different uh, types of glycerolipids on controlling that uh, membrane fluidity uh, and how that might affect uh, uh, photosynthesis. So this is at early stages, but we have provided them with uh, selected lines that are homozygous PT, uh, homozygous B73, our, uh, our regions of interest. And they are going to try to start now uh, uh, doing these tests and see if there is an effect on, on chloroplast membranes and eventually on photosynthesis uh, efficiency. 
One quick question. You said sure that B73 allele was dominant. Is the enzyme a dimer? Is that? If the enzyme is a dimer, no. no. How do you explain dominance of the B73 allele then? So we think that because it's, uh, it's uh, we think that in PT we have a deleterious uh, uh, allele. So you, uh, you only need uh, one copy of the, uh, of the allele to be uh, uh, an effective enzyme. If there are no further questions, let's thank Rory and Ruben for their wonderful seminars. This, I, I think this is rare. I haven't heard these kind of like uh, presentations here at Simmer. We should do more often uh, these kind of seminars. Let's thank them both. So for, the, for the next hour or so, they'll be in the, uh, in the biosafety meeting room. We are going to be talking with them if you want to if you have further questions or you want to explore some other uh, collaborations or whatever, stop by. And they'll be here, I think, all day. In the afternoon, you can catch up with them at the party. I'm not sure that's going to be the right venue to <laughs> talk science, but who knows. All right, thank you. Thank you all for coming. It's very nice that all of you showed up.